half in a half and a chance to win though Raphael got bagged Jaden Sancho bagged Two top signings bagged Two more signings lined up Four new man gonna wear this badge Four new man gonna wear this Woo! A month and a half and a chance for Wendell Raphael got bagged Jaden Sancho bagged Two top signings bagged Two more signings lined up Four new man gonna wear this badge Four new man gonna wear this Woo! Yo, it's the OT99 banter room where opinions are shared and smoke gets served. Look, we're back again with another show. It's your boy Firms and today I'm going to talk about the latest Manchester United related transfer news. But before I begin, remember to like, comment, subscribe and support the thing. Follow me on Instagram at OT99 underscore banter room. Twitter at 99 banter. Look, and TikTok, that's it, at OT99 Banter Room, all one word. Now let's get into it. So today we're going to talk about Ole Gunnar Solskjaer and his new contract. We're going to talk about Paul Pogba and his contract situation. And we're going to talk about Varane and his contract situation and where we are with that sort of, that sort of deal. But let's get into it. So, look, for me personally, I like... The transfer window i like the transfer news i know it's long-winded for some especially with what happened with the sancho situation but with manchester united and me and the transfer window i've always been excited about it and the reason why is because since uh, uh, sir alex ferguson left um we haven't been winning any trophies anything significant that will keep manchester united fans sort of happy i feel that Transfer window is all I could look to, do you know? One thing we've always had is a bit of a bit of money to spend. And I know Manchester United went through their phase where they didn't even know what model they were trying to do in terms of the transfer window. It was up, down, left, right. I remember when we did the Galacticos model and you know, we had Woodward beating his chest, gloating about how much money we've got in the in the transfer kitty. And you know, I remember, you know, we was doing this the Galacticos thing and, and we went on to sort of purchase guys like Falcao or we went on to purchase guys like Di Maria. And it never quite worked out. And I knew that model, you know, in hindsight didn't really work out for us. But at the minute, I, at that moment, I was really excited thinking, wow, like Di Maria, what's he going to do for us? At that time, Falcao before, you know, when we got him, I thought, you know, it's a top striker. Never worked out. Um, but it was exciting. Um, and obviously we find ourselves here, fast forward, you know, we're in a position where we're being linked with guys like Varane, and, you know, Karma Vingers and all of those stuff. It's great to hear, but still at the same time, it's like, you know, we're trying to keep it, you know, um, Premier League proven as well, which is fair. Um, English as well at times, you know, I think we was linked with um, that Newcastle lad and uh, I didn't really like, there's some names that I, I wasn't really feeling too much. Uh, but overall, I feel like Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, you know, the guys that he's been linked with is guys that I can really see, you know. It's, it's names that is exciting, basically, put it like that. And with Maguire, with all the stick he's got, he's still one of the, I would say, top 10 centre-backs um, out there. Um, Aaron Wan-Bissaka is still a quality and um, might back, you know. He, he's a good acquisition. Donny van der Beek, you know, for me, I, well, from what I've seen in Ajax, he's, he's really good. Um, obviously, he's not getting an opportunity at Manchester United. Um, but so I, I'm always excited anyway, with the transfer news. I'm always excited. And as you can see, I'm sure Manchester United fans are excited, you know. And I always had the feeling that, you know, this season with the transfer window was going to be big because of what the Glazers did with the whole ESL thing. Um, I always feel like they're going to try and make it up to the fans and do something big in the window. And I feel like they're finally uh, sort of taking advantage of the COVID sort of market. I was expecting that last season, but this season, hopefully, fingers crossed, we get, you know, another deal over the line next week. Um, but we're taking advantage of it, you know, we're utilising our, our finances, our resources in our correct way. And, you know, Woodward's obviously still clearly heavily involved in these discussions and these transfer deals. But I'm also starting to think because we're working on multiple deals or you're seeing multiple names being thrown out instead of the one long winded one and then the next one. It's making me feel that potentially this new structure that Manchester United put in place with Darren Fletcher and Murtoff and all of these guys is actually, you know, helping us to function better and become more efficient. But time will tell, you know, it's easy to put, you know, have discussions or, or inquire, uh, you know, you see news tabloids out in a in, in, out saying you were linked with this player and that player but can we actually get it over the line 
And two, how long has it taken us to get these things over the line? We don't want to be in a situation where we're doing pre-season um, or starting the season, sorry, and then these guys are ain't over the line. We want guys early as possible, get them in pre-season, get them, you know, comfortable, familiar with the surroundings, you know, the training complex and all of that stuff. It just helps, you know, it helps, it really does. But ideally, you know, you want them in for the first game, which is Leeds, all settled, all discussing, knowing each other, do you know what I mean? It helps. Um, so, you know, the verdict's still out on that, but it always is something that I'm here for. I'm excited. I know, I know, like I said earlier, people don't like it. Some people do, some people don't. Me, I love it, and I'm here to bring you all the smoke. So let's get started with Ole Gunnar Social. So Ole Gunnar Social got a new contract to Sky Sports, you know, came out recently, last week, and said that Ole Gunnar Social's got a new contract to 2024 um, with an option to extend that contract by a year to 2025. And now many people would be like, you know, Oli's gonna social, we know he's split the fan base. People are like, you know, upset about it. And people are like, you know, he deserves it. I'll tell you my opinion in, in a minute. But the one thing I'm not really worried about is the fact that he's got a new contract. Because for me, I know that if Oli gonna social is someone that's not performing, especially if he's been back this season, which is looking like he is going to be getting back. I don't think Manchester United is going to stick around if he's not like if he's doing really bad. Like if he if he qualifies if he qualifies for Champions League, maybe lifts up lifts a trophy, he's going to remain. Do you know what I mean? If he um, is finishing like fifth outside of Champions League, it's risky. It really is risky, and we see what happens to um, Van Gaal and all of these guys, Mourinho. It is risky. I feel like your name... Will, I mean, you saw it even last season when Pochettino was available and the talk started happening. Ole Gunnar Solskjaer always seems to find his feet when the pressure gets hot and then he goes on a nice little run and gets himself out of the trouble. But I feel like that's what's really been saving him. And I don't think there's any contract that's going to stop Manchester United from thinking, you know what, if they feel like it's really that bad that they, they won't... So I don't think it, it will stop them from thinking, OK, we need to terminate this contract and bring someone else in. Who that person will be... I don't know, you know, but I don't think that should be something that, you know, everyone's worried about thinking, oh, no, we're tied to, to Ole Gunnar Solskjaer to 2025. But my personal views on Ole Gunnar Solskjaer is this. So let me read what he said first about, what, about his appointment after his sort of contract announcement. So Ole Gunnar Solskjaer says, everyone knows the feeling I have for this club and I am delighted to have signed this new contract. It isn't. It is an exciting time for Manchester United. We have built a squad with a good balance of youth and experienced players that are hungry for success. He then goes on to say, I have a fantastic coaching team around me um, and we are all ready to take that next step on our journey. Manchester United have Manchester United wants to be winning the biggest and best trophies and that's what we are still striving for. We have improved both off and on the pitch and we will continue over the coming season. I can't wait to get out in front of the packed Old Trafford and get this campaign started. Now, I'm happy that Ole Gunnar Solskjaer is excited for him to go. I'm happy that, you know, he's happy to be manage managing Manchester United. Um, and I'm happy, like, you know, he's willing to take this club to the next level. So, obviously, that optimism, excitement, that confidence is there. One thing I don't necessarily agree with in that statement is that he's got a fantastic coaching team. Now, if you're Manchester United and you studied our last seasons, you would have understood that Manchester United has got a lot of flaws. We've got a lot of issues with our coaching, especially around the set piece, set pieces, around pressing the opposition. You know, we often see guys that are doing it in isolation, like Bruno Fernandes or Carvani and stuff like that. We want the whole team being able to press, you know, press higher up the line, you know, not standing back off these guys and letting them take 20 yard, 30 yard sh shots or passing around us. So that's something that I personally don't like about the way that we play. You know, play a higher line and I know probably we're limited to the players that we've got, but that's stuff that I like to see. Definitely with the set pieces, how we defend corners, it's atrocious, but Manchester United is making steps. You know, we've appointed a set piece specialist and added them to the coach and staff. So that's something that I can say. Do you know what? Maybe Ole Gunnar Solskjaer is identifying 
the flaws or, or sort of their weak areas and trying to slowly address these things. And I hope that we can just be addressing it, you know, addressing it more. Uh, you know, there's things again around the positioning of our DMs, for example. There's no reason why we can't have either Scott McTominay and Fred sitting, shielding the line like you would see Declan Rice doing it for England or West Ham. It seems that we, yeah, they're not natural DMs, but I feel like you should just be able to maintain that discipline to just, you know, shield the back four. Allow Pogba to be able to do his thing. It's because we ain't got someone that's disciplined or someone that can do that job by themselves. Maybe it's a talent, maybe it's just not in their locker, but we've had to play Scott McTominay and Fred and it takes up a position where, you know, you know, sometimes we've seen that Pogba's had to had to pay the price for that. Um, but what you really need is your best players on the pitch as much as possible. So for me, Colton's got a lot of improvement there, but I would say they're, they're okay, but I wouldn't say they're fantastic. But Oli Gunnar's making some steps. And for me, I mean, uh, I would say, you know, obviously we got to four semi-finals um, with Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, but Ole Gunnar Solskjaer got to these finals and there's a lot of managers that wasn't getting to these semi-final stages. Ole Gunnar Solskjaer was. To lose four semi-finals was terrible, heartbreaking. Um, and a final, obviously, now with Europa League. Again, Ole made progress to get to the finals, a step up from the previous season where it was just semi-finals. But again, he fumbled the bag. Um... But I think it's kind of, I think it's, it will be a bit harsh to say he doesn't deserve it. Whether you want him to be there is another story. Whether you think Ole Gunnar Solskjaer can lift the trophy, you know, any trophy significant with Manchester United is another story. But to say he doesn't deserve it is one that I'll say is probably is a bit too harsh because at the end of the day, you know, he finished third in the, you know, his first season, second season, finished second. Um, and I think there was some clip going around, a little snapshot I saw on my WhatsApp you know, since he joined in, in sort of 2018, is wrapped up that the third highest points. I think it was like City, maybe Liverpool or something, then Manchester United, something along those lines. Um, even though, you know, some may not like, you know, how he, you know, his tactics and stuff or, you know, some may not think he's the finished article. I do feel like he deserves his place, you know, to finish second and then sack a manager for someone that, for a Manchester United that has not been in that place, you know. I can understand if you were a, if you were a PSG or if you were, and even them, they didn't sack um, Pochettino for finishing second, you know. If you were Bayern Munich, um, you know, Real Madrid or Barca type teams, I could understand it. But Manchester United since Fergie has been rocky. We've been finishing, you know, when is it, like six, seventh place, whatever it is. Manchester United's not in a place where we can say, oh, we finished second, let's sack this manager, Do you know. Yeah, we have big expectations in our fan base, but there's being a bit realistic, being a bit realistic of understanding where we are right now. Obviously not settling for mediocrity, but just understanding where we are right now. And to sack a guy that's finished third, then finished second, you know, it's a bit harsh to say, you know, um, to sack him because he is making progress. And some may say, you know, Chelsea, they had Lampard in the first half of the season. People were saying that Lampard is better than only at times, you know, if you speak to certain um, Chelsea fans. You know, everyone still had the same challenges of COVID. You know, uh, what else? It? What else? You know, people, you know, injuries, you know, people say Liverpool, the injuries. Look, injuries is part and parcel of the game. Like, Liverpool got really lucky, you know, not last season, but the season before that. And uh, for a couple of years, we've not having major heart-wrenching injuries, you know, Man United, your Arsenal, so all of these teams, they've been getting it season in, season out. And we've just been, you know, managing to cope. Pogba's always going off injured. Martial's always going off injured. Rashford, they all have been their times, long plus, um, long periods of injury and stuff like that and i just feel like liverpool's they got hit hard it all came out once but this is why you have to prepare your squad in order to manage these sort of situations this is all part and parcel of football we can't really be making excuses about you know these these guys got hit with injuries this is the reason why or because lampard if Thomas tuchel was here at chelsea's then you know they would have done x y and z look we are where we are like the board's there to be making these decisions about your managers your managers is there to be making your decisions and your board about players that you should be bringing in to give your team squad depth chelsea at the end of the day they are where they are because they got that squad depth they are where they are because they chose to make that decision to sack or um, lampard and bring in tuchel city is where they are because they've got a top quality manager and they've got two first teams do you understand they made sure that they are two first teams it's not because 
they thought, oh, they're not leaving it to, oh, I've never done this because i got injuries. They're making sure that they're, they're mitigating that risk and buying the players that they need. It's all part and parcel of the game. So for me, I feel like everyone was under the subject to no fans, subjected to COVID, subjected to like the same sort of challenges. And at the end of the day, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer ended up second. So for me, I'll say he deserves it based on that premise. Whether I think he could go on to win the league is another story. I feel like we're going to have to make significant strides um, in a transfer window and our opposition doesn't strengthen. And that's the only way I would be like, do you know what? Yeah, we can close the gap up and maybe make a serious challenge. But, you know, you have to look at the opposition you're up against. We're talking about Oli, you know, you know, some say he's not got the um, uh, the um, pedigree to do, the, do it at Manchester United, but you're comparing him and you're comparing him against Pep. If you remove the Pep and the Klopp, I'll be very optimistic. Some may say Tuchel, but I'll be very optimistic with... Even I don't really think that like Klopp this season, unless he does a mad one in the transfer window, is going to be the same. I don't think they're even going to finish in the top two. Um, but I'll be very optimistic. But we're up against top managers. You understand? You're looking at a, a, a Klopp who's done Premier League, Champions League back-to-back. -back. You're looking at um, City that's knocking on the door, Champions League getting closer and closer. Premier League, you know, winning it by a landslide. You know what I mean? You're talking about guys like um, Thomas Tuchel who just won the Champions League. And now, for me, it's a major ask to be like, yeah, you, you know, only must only now his next thing is to win the Premier League. Look who he's up against. And I think people are a bit unrealistic. I think it's more of the, I'm a Manchester United fan. I'm used to winning, you know, Sir Alex Ferguson, like the standards we set ourselves over these years. And I think we use it to cloud or get confused about where Manchester United actually is right now. This is a team that's been finishing 6-7, floundering, getting into Champions League sometimes, not coming, not finishing it in Champions League the next season. This is the first time in a, since how long that we finished in Champions League back-to-back. -back. You know what I mean? But certain people just need to realise that this isn't the Manchester United that you're used to. We've got big expectations, yes, and it puts pressure on the board and, and, and whoever that we, we can't slack. But at the end of the day, there's one thing accepting mediocrity and there's another thing understanding the situation where we are. And I feel that like Ole Gunnar Solskjaer definitely um, deserves to have at least 12 more months to um, showcase what he's about. So for me, I feel like um, he deserves it. And there's another thing that just because Ole Gunnar Solskjaer got, like I said, just because he got a four uh, a contract to 2024 plus an additional year, doesn't mean that um, Manchester United won't make the decision to get rid of him if his season's so bad. You know, just last season, it was Pochettino's name that was being linked and Ole Gunnar Solskjaer managed to turn it around. He had goals on these nice long runs. But if that doesn't happen next season and we've invested heavily, look, those those stories will start cropping up again. You know, it's all going to start coming back to the surface again. I don't know what manager will come in and replace Ole Gunnar Solskjaer if that was to happen. Yeah, I couldn't tell you if, you know, who the next manager will be. But what I would say is that yeah, if that time happened, if that came around again where Ole Gunnar Solskjaer wasn't performing well and it was terrible and it didn't seem like he could lift them on well after the team, then that news will come up again. So I wouldn't, I'm not too worried about, you know, 20, 2024 plus a year contract extension. But moving on, moving on, on. But well done, Oli. Well done, Oli. I'll give you that. Moving on, though. Let's move on. So obviously the next pressing news, the big news is... I'm even to Paul Pogba actually before I you know get onto Varane. So Paul Pogba, so we've heard news come out since I've been sort of live about Paul Pogba and his situation. So we've heard news saying you know that Paul Pogba um, is 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 moving closer to he's he's considering the idea of of joining PSG um, and sort of he's in contract negotiations, Riola and, and, and sort of the club with PSG and things along those lines to facilitate that move. We've also heard news up that's came out, I think last week, maybe from the Mirror or so, saying that, you know, Manchester United, either the Mirror or the Sun, one of the two, saying that, um, you know, Pogba rejected a 350k contract offer um, from Manchester United. Um, Again, I don't know the truth behind that, you know, but for me, I, I feel like we're still negotiating. We've heard it in the news recently, you know, um, Fabrizio's re reaffirmed it, you know, we've heard it again from um, uh, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's mouth to say, you know, that um, 
his dialogue with Pogba has always been sort of fine and Pogba's looking forward to the new season. That's all he's actually heard. He's not heard about Pogba wanting to move. Um, so for me, you know, he's looking forward to the new season. Um, what else is it saying? So, um, and there's a potential, there's a potential possibility that Pogba may stay longer at Manchester United as well. So he's probably, I don't know if he's hinting um, there and maybe that, you know, contract discussions are going in some sort of positive direction or whatever. I have no idea. Um, but what I do feel is that Pogba is going to be of us next season. I do not feel like he's going to be moving to PSG personally. Um, although there's a chance, I just don't see it. I don't see Pogba going to PSG now. I, when I've sat down and it, I, I just thought, you know, probably he's not going to go there, you know. And with someone like Pogba, you know, if you've got 12 months left on your contract, you can agree a contract with any team in the world come January. Why would you want to rush the decision if your heart isn't fully in it? Like if you're not fully made up your mind, you can equally, this is the best scenario. You can equally test the, wait to see what Manchester United does in the transfer window for one. Test the waters, um, stay with Manchester United come January, sign a contract then, or sign a contract with a new club then, and walk for free. See how Manchester United is progressing in this season that we're saying, okay, we've got all this ambition and stuff like that, we want to win titles. He can wait it out and wait until the end of his contract and then decide, okay, you know, I've assessed it. Manchester United has done extremely well. I'm happy with the direction that they're going in. They're actually challenging for a title, like realistically, lifted a trophy, let me sign a new contract and commit my last big sort of contract sort of agreement with Manchester United. He can do that. He's got the power to do that. Or he can say, you know what, I'm going to wait to the end of the season, next season, and say, you know, see where Mbappe goes, for example, if he goes Real Madrid. You know, he can potentially go there as well and say, you know, I feel like uh, me, you, in Real Madrid, big limelight, big stage, we can do stuff. You know, Real Madrid's got the history of winning trophies. And let's not forget, Real Madrid may not have any ish, um, money at the minute, but you've got guys that um, Gareth Bell's contract is expiring in 2022. And he's on big wages. You've got guys that cruise, you know, Modric and stuff like that. There's Marcelo, you know, there's guys that they can, you know, offload off their books in addition to, you know, to free up that capacity. So for me, I wouldn't say that, you know, being able to afford Pogba or being able to afford Mbappe is, is, is outside of their remit come next season. Because I feel like they would have freed up a lot of the wage budget, you know, um, being able to... to, to you know, manoeuvre guys out of the club or stuff like that. So for me, I can see it. I can see it happening next year. You know, potentially Pogba and Mbappe going to um, to Real Madrid. But if I was Pogba, I wouldn't be in any rush to sign an, uh, a contract at Manchester United. Not saying like I don't want him to, because I really do. It's just if he's got that uncertainty, why rush it? You know. Manchester United may want him to sign a contract, but all the power really is in Pogba's hands. He can make that decision. He can take as much time as he wants. At the end of the day, there's no way that we can make Pogba move to PSG or move to any other club because the power's in his hands at the end of the day. So we just have to sit this out and wait. But I'm slightly optimistic that Pogba could potentially sign. Um, but it probably depends on what we do in the transfer window. I, I, I see this happening later on in the transfer window. If he does, if there is any sort of decisiveness on what his future may be with Manchester United, it won't be anytime soon, I don't think. Um, and yeah, we, we've got probably another 12 months to, to, to try and um, sway him, you know. But I would really like to see Pogba staying at Manchester United. But then it raises the question of, okay, if Pogba's staying, and you want Bruno to be playing in a team with Pogba getting the best out of your best midfielders, how do we enable that? Because we've seen Pogba play out of position, be benched. He's been playing out wide. Some people like it, some people don't. Defensively, I don't think it's great for us, him tracking back and covering his fullback. But he interlinks well with the, you know, the likes of your Cavani's and Bruno's higher up the pitch on the wing. On the right-hand side, it didn't work out so well for him. But on the left, he, he did do he did do okay attack wise, but defensively it was a mess, you know. Um, and obviously in the middle, you know, we've had to play two DMs at times, especially in the big games in te against teams that is attacking, because 
either Fred or McTominay couldn't do the job by themselves. And at times, you know, Pogba's had to, you know, he, he, he sacrificed, Oli sacrificed the position, sacrificed Oli's, um, Pogba's position in the team because of that. Now, to get the best, like, for keeping Pogba, one. So, the question is, do you keep someone, right, that maybe doesn't really want to be at the squad and make him your highest paid player? Because chances are, he's probably going to be joint highest with David De Gea or highest paid player at Manchester United. What example does that set keeping a guy who's not 100% committed, making him your highest paid player at your club and he doesn't really want to be here? He's been trying to leave. I mean, I read an article, I don't know if it was from like Simon Stone or someone like that, saying that, you know, the plan was always that Pogba came uh, in, in for three years, Jake Man United stayed about three years and then the plan was to move him on after those three years and go um, to Real Madrid. Obviously, it didn't work out like that because COVID hit and all of these things and he finds himself still here now. But his intentions, I don't feel, was to ever come to Manchester United and retire. I mean, we got really lucky. I remember when we was going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Real Madrid with his transfer fee. Real Madrid didn't have the funds, well, you know, according to them, to pay that money that we paid to get Pogba, 89 million, 90 million or whatever. If they did have the money, where would Pogba be, do you know? Where would he be today? So for me, I mean, he said he's got unfinished business, pog back on all of that stuff. But in reality, would he be at Manchester United if Real Madrid had the cash? Probably not. So I don't feel like he's tied down to the club or loyal to the club or anything like that. And you're going to make him the highest paid player. Not like to say he isn't professional because he is very, very professional. But he's come out and openly said, his agent come out and openly said, he's going to move, he's going to move. He said he wants to move. And then you're know, making him your highest paid player. For me, if he wants to go, we should move and we can rebuild. Yes, you're losing a world-class player, you know, a quality player when he's at his best, but or when he's on it, should I say. But for me, he's got to want to play for the club at the end of the day. You know, so it's an easy decision. If he doesn't want to play for the club, you don't make him your highest paid. Because making Pogba your highest paid player comes with consequences. Do you know? It really does. I mean, you're doing contract negotiations with Bruno, Bruno's looking at who's the highest paid player. I deserve to be on parity with that. You've got guys coming through like, you know, Sancho in 2026, he's gonna be, or even before that, having contract renewals. Rashford, you know, we've got your Luke Shaws, you've got all the new guys coming in, coming up saying, you know what? I want parity with these guys. You see why Real Madrid and Barcelona are struggling right now, because the ceiling is set high, set high in terms of wages with Messi, he's on a million. Then you've got guys thinking, you know what? I need to be, close to that they're not as good as Messi no way in there but it raises up the average clearly because he's he's getting so much you see Griezmann on about 600k for example you know you know Real Madrid you've got Bell on 600 Manchester United could equally be like that five six seven years eight years down the line if we're not careful with our wage budget but at the same time if you're gonna be in that position you don't want to have a double blow like being in that position but equally you don't have players that want to play for your team and wear the shirt and it, it just doesn't make sense to me but going back to the thing about Pogba and keeping Pogba we've got to be getting the best out of Pogba at the same time Manchester United has been linked with a raft of midfielders mainly Declan Rice, Karmavinga, Saunagez, Saunagez, Declan, Saunagez is long term, long standing Kamavinga is probably more recent and then sound again, um, Declan Rice again, maybe the last year or two. Now, for me, I've been thinking, you know, Manchester United really need a guy. You've got two very attacking players in Paul Pogba and Bruno Fernandes. Bruno Fernandes is a very risky guy and loses the ball quite a lot. Um, Pogba at times, you know, he's, he's shown it, he's, especially in the Euros, that he, he's world class, but at times he can you know, lose a bit of concentration, get knocked off the ball, lose the ball, and then, you know, in the midfield, it leads to sort of the, the counter-attack or whatever it is. So what we do need is someone shielding, in my opinion, and there's various different types of DMs, you know, um, NK talked about it in our last episode. But for me, I really do feel like we need someone that can just, it's got really good positional sense. And I feel like that's what we lack with Fred and Scott McTominay. When you think of Fred, you think of someone that covers every blade of grass. That's a really good thing. But at the same time, you're thinking, why when you think of Fred when I think of Fred I feel like I always think about him chasing someone down and for me why isn't your position in there in the first place where you could just be 
doing a lot more interceptions, you know what I mean, rather than chasing someone and, and nagging at their, their ankles, you know what I mean? And same with Scott McTominay. Scott McTominay is a guy that's got seven goals. He's a guy that at his best when he's advancing forward, running into the box and stuff, making those striding runs. He's not a DM. The positional sense is not really that great. And then you looked in the Euros and you saw Declan Rice, and I don't want Declan Rice at my club, especially for that price. No offence to Declan Rice, he's a, you know, he's a good... He's a, he's a good player, but I just don't feel like Manchester United should be paying, forking out 100 million for someone like him. Um, for many, many guys in the market in DMs, I don't, I just don't see why we should be doing that. But you saw what I saw with Declan Rice, he had really good positional sense. I mean, that goes a long way. It went a long way of England keeping their clean sheets. It does go a long way. Um, can we get better? Yes. Um, my, my thing is, I feel like we should get Wolford and Diddy. Um, potentially as the, you know, the next best combative type DM, destroyer DM next to Kante. He's not as good as Kante, but someone that can just hold the middle by themselves and allow Pogba and Bruno to do their thing. I want someone, a complete um, sort of uh, destroyer DM rather than having someone that's a bit mixed like Neves. You know, people talk about Kamavinga, Neves. Guys will be quality signings, don't get me wrong. Um, Sound of Gez, but they're kind of like mixed type mixed type things that could equally work but it just depends on who they're partnered with in the midfield when i look at bruno and pogba these are guys that are pressing up high very attacking minded they need to do their thing pogba wants to be able to roam he doesn't really like doing the nitty gritty defensive stuff bruno fernandez does press but again he loses the ball so much and he's very attacking for me we need someone sitting in front of those center backs doing a sweeper stuff and that's why I say someone like Watford and Diddy and if we're going to keep Pogba we need to have that appropriate DM to support him and we're not linked with the, we're not linked to linked with Watford and Diddy we're linked to Declan Rice who I don't think is worth the, the 100 million it feels worth maybe 40 million now I mean 50 million I'll say okay but 100 million is, is, is just another English tax sound I guess I'm not convinced he didn't really have a good season last season I think it was injured maybe but his price tag for you to be linked to 50 million euros is, is kind of like what's happened, you know? This is a guy that he was untouchable, like, you know, two seasons ago. And now you can get him for this. And maybe I know COVID market and, you know, teams have been hit, but it doesn't stop teams from, it doesn't stop Atletico from Madrid from saying they want 40 million euros for, for Kieran Trippier, our 31 year old. Do you know what I mean? So there's, there's levels to it. And this is the same club we're talking about. So for me, I don't know. You know, they're saying sound again is 50 million euros, Kieran Trippier, 40 million euros. That's 10 million euros between them. It doesn't make sense. But for me, I'd be happy to see Pogba stay, but we do need to make sure that we get a DM. Fred has shown signs that he could do it. You know, he's got signs where, he, he, you know, he's, he's very aggressive. He's very sort of, um, uh, he, sort of, he's got the tenacity, he's got the drive, and he's got a pass as well at times. We've seen where he can pick a pass, but it's just not consistent enough. Can he do that job? Can he? Does he have that positional sense? Can he take the ball from the defence and, and, and carry the ball? I don't know. I feel like we need a new DM. But Pogba, we have to wait and see. I mean, there's mixed messages going around here and there, but I do feel like we're trying our best to keep him. I do feel like he'll be with us next season. Whether we'll sign a new contract is yet to be seen, but I do think he'll be with us next season. Um, do you know what? We have to wait and see, but I feel like Manchester United, we've got to keep a World Cup winner. We've got to keep a Europa League winner. We've got to keep our best players if we're going to be progressing you know um and that's just the way i see it but on the other side i do feel like we've been trying to squeeze in pogba and i do feel like probably pogba man united would probably be a lot more balanced with the players you know if we wanted to get a dm uh and pogba was to leave i do feel like if we brought in like a karma vinka maybe we'll be a lot more balanced in the midfield or even a neves it may not be as, as, the quality may have dropped, but I just feel like we'll be probably balanced in that sense. I don't feel like Man United will crumble. We've still got Donny van der Beek waiting in the wings. Again, I feel like um, if you do to a switch to a 4-3-3 especially, um, I don't see why you couldn't hold down like a Scott McTominay, Fred and Donny van der Beek in midfield at times, or Bruno, or played um, uh, uh, Fred Donny van der Beek and maybe Bruno. Yeah, we might be exposed, but I just feel like because we haven't got that DM that is able to hold it down by himself, like I said. So I feel like DM is very important, but if we if Pogba was to leave and was to get a DM, I don't think it will be the end of the world. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, 
So we just have to wait and see what the market, what the transfer window says. There's still enough time in the transfer window to do what we need to do, but we'll just wait and see. So Varane, anyway, so Varane news has come out. Um, with Varane, every single media source is saying that this deal is looking very likely, very, very likely to be happening. You know, we've heard it from Mohamed Bahafsi and many other guys for Britjo saying, you know, this is looking likely. I'm just going to read out some stuff from um, a few uh, sort of journalists, you know, around sort of uh, Europe. So this one comes from Mario Corte Cortegana. I hope I said that right. So he's a, he's a Spanish journalist. He's well respected. I would say he's like tier two, tier one type uh, journalist. He basically said in the last hours, Man United and Real Madrid have made significant progress in a deal for Rafa Varane. There is a remarkable optimism between the parties um, that a deal could be struck. So that's coming from Mario Cortigana. Uh, um, it also, this one is from Mohamed Bahafsi. Um, negotiations, negotiations have started between Man United and Real Madrid for Rafael Varane. The two clubs have been exchanged for several hours. United have asked for Madrid's expectations. The coming week will be decisive. Uh, and also, there's another one from, um, again, Mario uh, Cortigana and Go Espana, again, Spanish outlet, saying Rafael Varane did not ask for Real Madrid, did not ask Real Madrid for more money. Perhaps why there was no second contract offer for them, to him, sorry, from Real Madrid. Real Madrid are aware that his desire is to enjoy an experience in a Premier League. So that is obviously positive news. And the figures that's being tooted around is somewhere between 45 million euros and mm, 55 million euros. So if we're looking at it, I'd say probably we can settle on 50 million euros roughly. 55 max um that's not too bad 50 million pounds 45 to 50 million pounds will seal the job and get someone of quality and i know man united is trying to delay it trying to test the resolve of real madrid trying to drive a hard bargain trying to get the price down but ultimately you know i mean if you was to tell me we got rafa around for 40 million 45 million i'll be like great that's amazing but at the same time if you told me that Real madrid, man united got uh, of four times Champions League winner, three times the league winner, World Cup winner for 50 million more, 50 million, you know, 10 million more, 50 million euros, 55 million euros. I'd be like, amazing, great. Like, it doesn't bother, bother me because the price is still worth it for someone like him. It's actually a bargain, to be honest. So for me, whether it's 45 million, whether it's 55 million, whether it's even 60 million euros, I'm still like, you know what, let's get this deal done. But obviously, you know, we're playing the hard game, trying to save every penny because you could potentially put it to guys, deals like Kieran Tripper or whatever, you know. So in a COVID market, a million means a lot these days than it would have meant probably a few. It, it'll always mean a lot, but I mean, it just it probably has a lot more, holds a lot more value now that we're in this COVID market. So I'm, I'm optimistic that we'll get this um, deal done. And I think there's been a lot of rumours and news, especially from um, saying that, you know, there's going to be... Um, big progress that's happening so next week is going to be a decisive week so we heard Fabrizio say it last week that this week was going to be you know potentially a big week and we saw the unveiling of Jaden Sancho the number 25 shirt a lot of people thought it would either be you know 7 or, or 16 for example but you know he got the 25 and then there's also now anyway that there's going to be a potentially a big week going forward so for me I'm excited to see the news I'm excited to see the news and hopefully we can get that deal over the line and for me Again, I feel like he would be a big acquisition and I feel like we can be challenging for the title if we've got Rafael Varane. We really can be challenging if we've got Rafael Varane, we've got Jaden, Jaden Sancho now. If we get a DM, top quality DM, um, I do feel like we can be challenging. And you know what? Let's see. We can lift up a trophy, whether it be FA Cup, well, you know, if it, well, anything. We can just potentially lift up a trophy. So for me, I'm excited. So that's my two cents. And remember to like, comment, subscribe and support the team. I'm out.